Back in 1987, a man who had finished work early that evening drove to the Golden Lion pub. It's a pub in Sydenham in South East London. He pulled into the car park and saw what he thought was a dummy lying on the ground in the beam of his headlights. But the reality was much worse. It was the body of Daniel Morgan, a 37-year-old private investigator, and he had been brutally killed. He'd even been left with an axe embedded in his head. It was gruesome. He'd been killed with an axe. The police described the case as a sticker. In other words, it's one they just can't solve. Daniel Morgan's death is the most investigated case in British history. And it's a tale mired in decades of police corruption and cover-ups. In a statement, the Met's commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, said... This case has been marred by a cycle of corruption, professional incompetence and defensiveness that has repeated itself over and over again. Over five different police investigations spanning nearly 25 years, 67 people have been arrested in connection with the murder, and eight of those were police officers. But no one has ever been brought to justice. And finally, last month, the UK's largest police force reached a financial settlement with Daniel Morgan's family. And it was the largest payout in the force's history. Mark Rowley officially apologised for the pain and suffering the force caused Daniel Morgan's family and agreed to significant compensation. So what went so wrong that the Met Police were found to be institutionally corrupt? And does this mean that Daniel Morgan's family will never find justice? You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, the unsolved murder of a private detective and decades of Met Police corruption. I'm Fiona Hamilton, the Crime and Security Editor at The Times. Last month, Fiona broke an exclusive update in the case, a case she'd been following for years. So The Times revealed that after more than three decades, that the Met had given its record payout of compensation to the family of Daniel Morgan following their lengthy fight for justice, which has sadly been unsuccessful so far, and also their fight to get to the truth of the corruption and failures and incompetence Mm. that surrounded his murder. How much are we talking? A record £2 million payout. Gosh. Well, let's rewind then and go all the way back to that spring night in in 1987, where this story starts, and a body is found in a car park in South East London. What happened? Who was it? It was particularly brutal murder in South East London in the car park of the Golden Lion in Sydenham, and the victim was Daniel Morgan. Mr Morgan was attacked after he left a pub in Sydenham in South East London. He'd worked as a specialist in debt collection for an investigation company. He was found axed to death in the pub car park. He lived locally, he was a father of two, and he worked for the private investigation company Southern Investigations. And over the many years since the murder, this has had to be investigated numerous times. Before we get into all of this, how many times has it actually been looked at? Well, it's always described as the most investigated murder in British history. There's officially five inquiries into the murder and there's been several reviews as well. So to say it's the most investigated murder in history certainly seems accurate. And at a cost to the public purse of estimates are more than £50 million. Well, let's go back to that first investigation then. How did the investigation into this begin? So the investigation was taken on very quickly by the Metropolitan Police And as has been apparent for a very long time, there were immediately corrupt 
links to detectives who were on the inquiry and elsewhere in the force. If you go back to the 1980s and you look at relationships between the police and private investigators and even criminals, the relationships were very different to as they were now. So in that area of Sydenham, it was well known that detectives locally drank in pubs at the same places as the private investigators involved in Southern investigations and also other agencies. And there was a really worrying pattern of police officers in the Metropolitan Police at the time who were moonlighting for the very investigation agency that the murder was involved in that they were investigating. What was Daniel investigating when he was killed, do we know? This is one of the issues that has never been fully gotten to the bottom of. Daniel Morgan's family have said he was looking into corruption in the police and that he was ready to blow the whistle on that. The panel into the Morgan murder, which spent eight years investigating the case and reported a couple of years ago, ultimately concluded there wasn't evidence that he was about to go public, as it were, with some major story about corruption. Detectives over the years considered a string of other motives in the killing. That link between corrupt police officers and organised criminals has been a long-running thread, but it wasn't properly seriously investigated by the Met at all. Detectives also looked into whether Morgan had embezzled money from Southern investigations, although they didn't find any evidence of that. He and his business partner, Jonathan Rees, were said to have a deteriorating relationship at the time of the murder. Mm. And there were other motives, including his relationships, that he was having an affair allegedly with another woman and that her husband may have been jealous and other various personal issues. And one of the people that you mentioned just there, Jonathan Reese, he was his business partner. And you said that there was a suggestion that they might have had some rift or, or feud at the time. Interestingly, he was the last person known to have seen Daniel Morgan alive. Yes, that's right. Morgan and Reese had met at the pub for a drink and Morgan had gone out to the car park afterwards where he was attacked. And so when police were looking into this, I imagine he was uh, immediately a person of interest. Yes, that's right. And then you get into the extremely murky weeds of this investigation straight away because Jonathan Reese was a suspect in the inquiry or certainly a person of interest they needed to talk to. One of the investigating officers was a detective called Sid Fillory who knew Reese, drank with Reese, and was friends with Reese. Sid Fillory took a witness statement off Jonathan Reese. And as I say, that was even though they were close friends and it later emerged he had been one of the officers who had moonlighted at Southern Investigations and ultimately he went on to take Daniel Morgan's job at the agency. Gosh, so it's quite clear that he shouldn't have actually been involved in this investigation. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear. What else happened in that first investigation? There was quite a lot. It was completely plagued with problems, really. There was a failure to properly record evidence, to properly secure the crime scene. Contamination of evidence, even including the body, was not avoided. Documents in Morgan's office disappeared. They've never been found. Key exhibits were destroyed, which means they couldn't be tested in future as forensic techniques developed. And just overall, the very basics you would mm. expect in a murder inquiry simply weren't carried out. So despite, you know, the litany of failures, detectives did plan the arrests of some suspects, although that was leaked to the Daily Mirror, and so there was a, a heads up in that sense. Mm. Jonathan Reese, some other police officers, including Sid Fillory and a couple of other suspects, were arrested, but the inquiries didn't go anywhere and they were released. And on those two, Jonathan Reese and also Sid Fillory, they eventually did actually face charges, is that right, in a subsequent, subsequent, subsequent investigation? Yeah, you have to fast forward to 2009. There had been a couple of other fairly useless inquiries and then the inquiry was taken over by a detective who continued to have the support of Daniel Morgan's family for many years and was really really focused on trying to get justice for that family. And he did secure charges against Jonathan Rees for murder and a few other suspects for murder, against Sid Fillory for perverting the course of justice. 
but that all came crashing down a couple of years later in an abusive process case at the Old Bailey, which showed a number of serious flaws in that case. What kind of flaws? So first of all, there were huge failures in disclosing evidence. It emerged that the Metropolitan Police had failed to disclose about 18 crates of evidence to the defence for them to peruse and see if there was anything relevant in it to them, Mm. which, given that the case had been going on for the best part of 25 years, was a pretty extraordinary lapse. And then there was a lot of focus on the detective in charge of the inquiry, a man called Dave Cook, who was accused of coaching the supergrass witnesses who were turning evidence against the murder suspects. And when you say supergrass, Fiona, what do you mean? Well, these were criminals who, for various reasons of their own, whether it be they wanted to be more treated more leniently themselves, they were willing to give evidence against the suspects in the Morgan case. And there's very strict rules about what detectives can say to people Mm. and very strict rules to prevent them from coaching witnesses and encouraging them too much about their evidence. And ultimately, the judge found that Dave Cook had breached those guidelines and that he had come very close to doing an act which tended to pervert the course of justice. And ultimately, it meant that the criminal case collapsed and all of the suspects were released with no further action. Sid Fillory and and Jonathan Rees had those charges against them dropped. What did they do next? They ultimately pursued the Met for malicious prosecution and they were successful. And the High Court judge awarded Rees, Fillory and a handful of other suspects compensation amounting to hundreds of thousands of pounds. Jonathan Rees and Sid Fillory have both always denied involvement in Daniel Morgan's murder. So we had five investigations, that one being the last, and no convictions, no whiff of justice. Yes, that's right. And over the years, there's just been the drip drip of more discoveries of failures in the case and more links of corruption and little bits of the truth have gradually come out. And when Theresa May was Home Secretary... She decided not to call a public inquiry where evidence would be heard in public and witnesses would have to give public evidence, but she set up the Daniel Morgan panel to investigate the case. And it took eight years and it reported halfway through 2021 and it concluded that the Met was institutionally corrupt, but it also sadly concluded that it's quite unlikely, really, that anyone will ever see justice over this murder. So, Fiona, you've explained to us the horrific issues around that first investigation, also around the involvement of Sid Fillory, the detective in that first investigation, about gathering evidence and securing the crime scene, all those things they didn't do. You mentioned the allegation of corruption as well running through all of this. What has been some of the other worrying pieces of of corruption that's been been highlighted throughout this long-running case? The really clear corruption occurred in the very first murder investigation in 1987. And the panel that investigated the case did not find lots and lots of other allegations of corruption in the four linked inquiries since and the various reviews. But what they really found was an institutional attempt to cover up those corruptions and those failings. Baroness alone, who was the chairperson of the panel, said that. By not acknowledging or confronting over the 34 years since the murder, its systemic failings or the failings of individual officers, by making incorrect assertions about the quality of investigations and by its lack of candour, which is evident from the materials we have examined, we believe that the Metropolitan Police's first objective was to protect itself. Dave Cook himself, who claimed he was investigated by the Metropolitan Police because he was trying to blow the whistle on corruption, said that allegations like that were often brushed under the carpet. And there was a general problem which the panel highlighted, which was it referred to a phrase known as the blue wall in policing. And this idea is that police officers stand together 
that they work together to support the fight against crime and to try and prevent crime. And it's known as this blue wall. But if you come up against that blue wall and you do anything such as try to show up corruption within the ranks of the blue wall, you yourself face being ostracized. So people who blow the whistle Mm. on corrupt allegations face being removed from their unit, scorned by their peers, and potentially face trumped up charges and allegations themselves. And so it was this really wide picture that was painted that gave the view of institutional corruption across this police force over many decades. Interestingly, it's also across forces as well, because even uh, different forces have been brought in to look at this case and how the Met handled it. And even they haven't acted as you would have wished. Yes, particularly Hampshire Constabulary. So they did a review just over a decade after the murder in which they had a look at the murder investigation from the off all of the evidence that was gathered, whether there were missing lines of inquiries that could now be pursued. And really crucially, they didn't look properly at the police officers who were suspected of involvement, and they didn't look at police officers who were suspected of disciplinary offences, such as, say, moonlighting for the agency or taking corrupt payments. And the panel really took a dim view of that review and said it was another case of the stench of corruption in this murder really being swept under the carpet. When the panel were looking into the investigation into Daniel Morgan's murder and and why it was dealt with so appallingly, did they look at what the motives might be for whoever killed Daniel Morgan? Yes, and they were also asked to investigate the connections between private investigators and police officers, but also with journalists at the News of the World, which is the Sunday tabloid owned by News International at the time and that was closed down after the phone hacking scandal. They found extensive links between Jonathan Rees Southern Investigations and the News of the World because he was being tasked to get information for journalists on their stories. And is it fair then to characterise it simply then as the the actual corruption was more a feature of the 80s and 90s and the modern day flavour of that corruption was more about covering up what had happened rather than the actual corruption still persisting? Is that fair to say? Yes, I think that's really fair. It's important to say that even now the Met completely denies institutional corruption in the same way it denies institutional racism, sexism and homophobia, acknowledging there is a problem but not to use that word. I have the deepest feelings for Daniel Morgan's family. They have shown extraordinary grit and determination and uh, courage. And yesterday I apologised again to them for um, our failings. Uh, But I don't accept that we are institutionally corrupt. Dame Cressida Dick, the former commissioner who was in post when this report was handed down, and now her successor, Sir Mark Rowley, say they recognise, of course, that there are corrupt officers, but they don't believe that corruption as a whole is so great that they would recognise the word institutional. So we're 35 years on-ish then from the murder and on that settlement that you told us about earlier that the family have now been paid, what kind of apology did they get, if any, from the Met? So the family got a really extensive apology from the Metropolitan Police as well as what we understand to be a £2 million settlement. So Mark Rowley, the current commissioner, apologised for a cycle of corruption and incompetence that had really mirrored the investigations over the years. And he said he unequivocally and unreservedly apologised for the failure of the Met to bring those responsible for the murder to justice, and that from the earliest stages, Daniel Morgan's family had been repeatedly and inexcusably let down by the Metropolitan Police. So, of course, that points to this idea that in its not just the initial corruption, but Rowley is admitting that... Mm. The Met's idea of its reputation and trying to salvage its reputation became more important than publicly admitting the truth of this case. You said that the £2 million payout was a record. I wonder in sort of what order of magnitude. Is that wildly above anything that the Met has paid out before or what? 
So settlement payments usually remain confidential, so I can't pretend to know the totality of what the Met is paying out in individual cases, although we have just run a story that showed in the past few years they paid out more than £50 million in settlements to members of the public. That's an average of £7 million a year, but that's across many different cases. From what is in the public domain and what we knew about the Daniel Morgan settlement, it did dwarf other cases. So if you remember the Operation Midland scandal, where a number of politicians and other members of the establishment were falsely accused of being in a paedophile ring, the former Tory MP uh, Harvey Proctor fought a long battle to clear his name and a long battle against the Metropolitan Police's handling of the case. And he was awarded nearly £1 million in damages. The family of Stephen Lawrence, who, of course, was the victim of a racist murder and resulted in the finding that the force was institutionally racist, they did receive a 320000 compensation payout. That was over the force's failure to properly investigate the murder, but that was a long time ago, more than two decades ago, that payout was awarded. But certainly in terms of other high-profile cases that I'm aware of, you'd be talking in the region of five-figure sums. Gosh. I'm not aware of something the size of the Morgan settlement. And arguably, for the police force in question, giving a payout is the easiest thing to do. I guess the harder thing to do is actually to look within yourselves and ensure that that doesn't happen again, be that racism after what happened with Stephen Lawrence or all that we know about misogyny and homophobia and the rest. With corruption... What is the plan? So in terms of the corruption issue, the Met certainly seemed to prefer this idea that a lot of the corruption was based in the 80s and 90s and that while they were resistant to accepting that for a long time, most of the problems have gone away. They did publish a very detailed response to the Daniel Morgan panel report and they have been publishing updates over the last couple of years. I suppose they tie in a lot about their fight against corruption into their dual work to rid the force of racist, misogynistic and homophobic officers. So there's been a big crackdown on officer misconduct. The number of sackings have increased. They're rechecking people's vetting. They're doing dip samples of officers who have been accused of wrongdoing in the past to double check that if somebody is still serving, it's appropriate that they're still there. On corruption specifically, they point to things like the fact they have community panels that review investigations where all lines of inquiry have been exhausted to double check their work. But there was a very worrying report after the Daniel Morgan panel by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, which is one of the key police watchdogs. And it essentially said that forget things like brown paper envelopes, okay, perhaps occasionally that kind of corruption still exists, but there's been a big step change in the last Mm. 30, 40 years. But the view of corruption is probably a little bit more opaque now, but they said that they were still concerned that the Metropolitan Police just simply didn't have a lid on it. So it was more uh, concerns about, say, with vetting, that the Met was recruiting people with dubious connections, criminal connections, or potentially in some cases criminal histories that were undesirable, that they were still not uh, securing exhibits properly. So the way that they were securing um, cash and drugs and other items was described actually as dire. This report was only issued a year or so ago, and given that it took an awful long time for the Met to admit massive failings in the Morgan case, but for these failings to be exposed in very recent history was was deeply concerning. And all that work that, that's underway is all very well, but how did the Morgan family feel about all of this? You, you mentioned the payout, but I, I don't know, they must still be upset that there's no immediate prospect of justice coming down the slipway anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, it's a tragedy for the Morgan family because it wasn't about the money for them. It was about securing justice for Daniel. And that's something that hasn't happened. And it's important to say that the Morgan family, and particularly Daniel's brother, Alistair, who has been an incredible campaigner who hasn't given up at all over a few decades in terms of trying to secure justice for his brother and at many times being a lone voice in trying to hold the Metropolitan Police to account over this case. 
it's tarnished all of our lives, you know, all the people close to Daniel for, for so long. I mean, we haven't let it defeat us, you know. We've tried to take pleasure in life where we can and have done that, you know, to the best of our ability. But it's been like a, I suppose a millstone is the best description. None of this would have happened without him. And he's happy, he says, that he's received this apology and he's finally getting to the truth of what happened, but he doesn't have that ultimate truth. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Luke Jones, and my guest, crime and security editor at The Times, Fiona Hamilton. You can find all of Fiona's work at thetimes.co.uk or in print, of course, and we'll put links to her reports on Daniel Morgan in the episode notes. If you're a subscriber, you can read more about Fiona's reporting on the Met Police and other police forces online. The producer today was Sam Chantarasak with production assistance from Sasha Nagara. The executive producer was Will Rowe and sound design was by David Crackles. If you have a story that you think we should be covering, maybe even an idea for a future episode, or maybe you've got thoughts on what you've just heard, let us know. You can email storiesofourtimes at thetimes.co.uk. Goodbye. <laughs>